Okay, and thanks for everyone for, for coming. And today I'm going to talk about like how financial innovation affects the uh, technological innovation. And first, let me give a kind of a brief uh, you know, definition of financial innovation. It's the act of creating new um, like, you know, financial instruments, technologies, institutions, and markets. Well, and maybe too, like, too boring to just look at um, the definition. Let me give you some like, real-world example. Like, you know, a century ago, we have the stock market, which makes it much easier to trade on firm ownership. Like, before that, it's all private firms. After that, we have public firms, and we can easily trade their shares on the stock market. And after that, we have different kinds of like, uh, derivative securities, and in fact, some of the like, derivatives on commodities are even earlier than stock market. Uh, anyway, like, after that, we have uh, different kinds of derivative securities like options, futures, forward, swap, etc. And those derivatives can be on commodities like crude oil, cotton, and wheat, etc. They can be on publicly traded shares. They can also be on interest rate can be on like, you know, uh, the temperature, et cetera. So we have uh, you know, various kind of derivatives. And in recent years, there are like, much more financial innovation, especially in China. For, for example, the uh, P2P lending. And with P2P lending, we don't need to go to the bank. We can lend money. We can borrow money just via some online uh, platform. And we have the mobile pay. And it's not that popular in Hong Kong, but in in the mainland, you know, you can even go without taking any, any note with you. You can just bring a, a mobile. So that's all different kinds of, you know, um, financial innovation. But one thing is not that clear is how does financial innovation affect our real economy? And because there are so many financial innovations that we cannot check it one by one. So my research focused on one particular type of um, financial innovation, which is called credit default swap. We call it CDS. CDS is one kind of um, um, you know, financial uh, derivative. And in CDS, there are three parties, protection buyer, protection seller, and reference entity. And protection buyer is just the CDS buyer. They are normally lenders. And reference entity are normally firms, and they are borrowers. So the lenders lend money to the borrowers, to the firm. At the same time, they can buy CDS from the protection seller, which is also like the CDS seller. And they pay periodic premium to CDS seller. If the reference entity, the firm keeps solvent, the firm is healthy, then nothing happens. But once the firm default the debt. For example, the firm go bankrupt and don't have enough capacity to repay the, uh, the loan. Then the CDS buyer can get compensation from CDS seller. So it's very similar to like the lenders lend money to the firm. At the same time, they buy an insurance. In case the firm default, they can get compensation. So that's CDS. And the reason why we look at CDS is because even if it's, it only start, you know, being popular in the U.S. since 1997, but today it's one of the most important uh, derivative securities. The notional value under CDS is even higher than some like traditional derivatives like the stock option. And what's more important is there are some, you know, um, controversy on, on CDS. On one hand, CDS, you know, may benefit the, the society because it gives the lenders an opportunity to hedge their credit risk, make them more willing to lend money to firms to support the economy. But on the other hand, it's not only lenders can buy CDS, the speculators can also buy it. So the speculators, they don't lend money, they don't lend any money to the firm. They simply buy CDS, betting that in the future the firm will default. And they can make money from that kind of you know, position. And because of this, CDS is criticized as you know, pushing the market further down during the financial crisis. So that's why we look at CDS. And we link CDS to technological innovation, mainly because 
technological innovation is one of the main driving force of economic growth nowadays. Like everyone is talking about innovation. So it means that it's very important. And there are a number of you know, a unique features of technological innovation as compared with the like, routine or normal investment. The first one is it's highly risky. Highly risky means that there's high probability of failure. Maybe 90% probability of failure, only 10% probability of like, succeed, or even 99% probability of failure. So it's highly risky, and it's long-term. It takes years, and it's complex and multi-stage. Next, let me link debt financing to technological innovation. Well, from prior studies, we got that debt holders are, in general, risk-verse, and they are short-term oriented. They benefit less from technological innovation. So overall, debt financing hurts innovation. It may not be that easy you know, to understand just from the, the words. Let me show you um, a graph. And in the graph, I plot the payoff function of debt holders. So the vertical axis is the lender's net payoff. That is how much money lenders can get. The horizontal axis is the value of the firm. So we have the repayment region. We have the default region. As long as firm value is higher than the face value of debt, the lenders can get all their money back. But the maximum they, they can get it's just the face fat of that. So it's a kind of a flat line. The, the, the flat line. As long as the firm is solvent, the lenders can get money back, but it's always the face fat of the debt. But once the firm go bankrupt, the firm default, debt holders may not get the full amount. So it's a kind of a downward sloped curve in the default region. And then lenders can only get what's left within the firm. So because of the payoff function, debt holders don't like risk taking. Because if the firm takes too much risk, the firm is very successful. The maximum the lenders can get is still the face value of that. They can't get any more. But once the firm fails, they will lose money, like in the default region. So in general, debt holders are risk averse. They prefer safe projects. So they don't like innovation because you know innovation is too risky but if the lenders can buy CDS they become less risk verse just like what the dotted line shows because if they buy CDS they get some protection when the firm go bankrupt even if the firm fail in innovation the firm default the debt but debt holders can still get some money back they have less loss from this kind of failure so their payoff function becomes the dotted line. It becomes flatter. And because of this, we say CDS is able to reduce debt holders' risk aversion. Therefore, CDS improves the technological um, innovation. So that's our uh, expectation. And we use patent as the proxy of the firm's innovation activities. And we find that after the introduction of CDS, firms are able to generate more patents. And the patents they generate have higher quality. So this is consistent with um, what we expect. And our conclusion is that you know, CDS stimulates technological innovation. And from here, we can say, Financial innovation have some non-negligible effect on the real economy. One way is through technological innovation. So that's all my uh, presentation. Thank you.